All right. So can you hear? Yeah, this works. All right. All right, it's time to get started. I would like to welcome all of you to the second day of the Anglo-American Literature Conference at Bill Kent University, where the theme this year is gender and sexuality. This conference, as you know, is co-organized by the Departments of English Language and Literature and American Culture and Literature. It is a student organization, and we as faculty are excited to see such a wonderful or organization and a sophisticated set of papers. We heard some of them yesterday, and we will continue to hear them today. We have some newcomers. All right. So the way this is going to work out is uh, I'm planning to sp speak for about um, 10 to 15 minutes total. Um, and the first panel starts at 10.30, which means that we may be able to take just a short stretch break between my comments and the first panel of the day. All right. Now, the first thing I want to say is that the English and American literature departments organizing a conference together, this is not a coincidence. In the time that I have today, I will suggest that to talk about Anglo-American literature is to talk about gender. First, I will comment on the development of what we have come to call transatlantic studies, and then address why discussions of gender and sexuality are essential to the study of transatlantic literature. Studies of literature at universities, um, not just in Turkey, but around the world, are often organized around the notion of nationhood. Turkish literature, Italian literature, we speak of English literature. This is not by any means natural. Implicit in this organization of knowledge is the understanding that each nation has a distinct cultural tradition. Yet, is this really the case? Are cultural or literary traditions really delineated by political boundaries and borders? And, equally importantly, which surprising connections or overarching ideologies do we risk overlooking in nation-based literature departments? Now that globalization is even more visible than before, the idea of distinct national literary traditions appears less compelling if it ever appeared convincing to begin with. I should also briefly note that while the study of literature um, still remains organized around the notion of nationhood today, there are also comparative literature departments precisely for addressing, um, the, the, addressing the problem of nation-based literary study. Anyway, to go back to this idea of distinct literary national literary traditions and the problematics of that idea, I'm going to ask you to consider a novel titled The Female American, published in 1768 under the pseudonym Unka Eliza Winkfield. We still do not know who used that pseudonym, perhaps never will. We do not know whether the author was from England or from the American colonies. This novel has a biracial heroine is set in the New World, but was published first in the Old, in London, with subsequent editions published in New England. The literary critic Michelle Burnham writes, whether female or male, American or British, the author of The Female American articulated for readers on both sides of the Atlantic an often radical account of a biracial heroine. Half English and half American Indian, the protagonist boasts of what she calls the oddity of her dress. She says, my mother used to dress me in a kind of mixed habit, neither perfectly Indian nor yet in the European taste, either of fine linen 
or rich silk. The print history of this novel problematizes the division of English and American literary traditions into two. But I speak of no this novel right now, not just because of that. I like the oddity of the female American's dress. Either fine linen or a rich silk, neither this nor yet that. This kind of indeterminate space is precisely what we wish to open up today, stepping beyond preconceived categories, stepping into a world of oddities that unsettle easy divisions and draw attention to unforeseen connections. Transatlantic literature is a field that has burgeoned in an intellectual climate where hybridity and cross-cultural exchange weigh heavier than the search for national unity. Transatlanticists pay attention to both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, asserting the salience of an Anglo-American world while remaining alert to its fractures. This conference itself predicated on the assumption that it makes sense to discuss English and American literature at the same time, gestures toward a transatlantic approach to literature. <coughs> Anglo-American literature, what was the glue? Why does it make sense to speak of an Anglo-American world? Many early immigrants to the New World left from the British Isles, and English, the language, later became the language of the United States of America. These are obvious facts, and on their own may very well suffice to justify a transatlantic perspective. But there is another story I'd, tr I'd like to try to tell. This is a narrative that literary critics and historians have been piecing together, I would say, in the last two decades or so. And in this narrative, gender plays a crucial role. The historian Sarah Pearsall writes, Gender was central to the way in which a British Atlantic world was created. Let's hear her account. Quote, the presence of English women became a vital means of measuring the settled status of the colonies established by the English in the New World. The presence of English and later British women in the colonies allowed for the smooth transition of property, language, and custom. In metropolitan eyes, Colonies did not become civilized when there were only English men there. They did so when English women were there too." End quote. In the New World, English men and women maintained what they perceived as traditional domestic habits because domesticity was precisely how they defined their identity as colonists. Through it, they sought to assert their difference from Native American and African peoples in the New World. But as Pearsall reminds us, the American colonies in turn unsettled traditional gender roles in the Anglo world. Women in the New World undertook duties which in Europe they would have no opportunity to. They transformed gender ideologies, which they employed to define their status in the new world. And when I say they transformed gender ideologies, we can think back to um, the novel Female American that I was talking about. In that novel, the heroine, who as I mentioned is biracial, really likes her bow and arrow. Um, because she, she's half English, but she's half American Indian, and she really likes using her bow and arrow, which in English standards of that day is really not traditionally feminine at all, but she, would, she will not give up her bow and arrow, and um, she likes to use it, and it comes in handy um, when she's 
stranded on a remote island, but that's a l long story. I bring this up because I think it's a clear example of what I mean when I say in the new world, traditional gender ideologies um, that were based on English traditions were indeed transformed. And then I would say also exported back into England where they performed a transformative function as well. Historically then, gender defined the Anglo-American world, set its identity, tightened the hyphen between the Anglo and the American. Those young scholars who are gathered today here, that's you, will be exploring how gender defined the Anglo-American world. In doing so, they will also be redefining the boundaries of literary study and renegotiating the cultural organization of sexual difference. And, and that cultural organization of sexual difference is precisely what we call gender, of course. I look forward to the exciting set of papers that we will hear today. And I wish you all a second day full of reflection and dialogue. Um, I see that now we have uh, 10 minutes till 10.30. 10.30 um, is when the first panel will start and I think we should wait until 10.30 because we may have some people arriving here who are just coming out of their 9.40 classes. So let's take a very short break and we will see you soon. Thank you. Three speakers are going to present their papers, Nurul Hudebaykan and Ülkem Anaflu from Mithat University and Jamal Egan from Istanbul University. They will be glad to answer your questions at the end of the panel. Our first speaker, Nurul Hudebaykan, having graduated from Mardin Antonyan Teacher Training High School in 2007, she began to study English language and literature at Bilkent University. After receiving her BA from Elite in 2011, she decided to pursue her academic career in a main program offered by the Department of Turkish Literature at Vita. She is interested in mystic writers and their works both in Turkish and Anglophone literature. Her paper is named Happily Ever After, Rewriting of Fairy Tales in Genital Intestines, Sexing the Cherry. Now please welcome Nurul Devaika. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start my presentation by thanking the organization committee because it's a privilege and pleasure to be here with you. And my paper is on rewriting of fairy tales and it questions the probability of the common ending. They got married and lived happily, happily ever after. And uh, it questions how this ending can be realized Let's begin. Happily ever after, rewriting of fairy tales in gentle intestines, sex, sex in the cherry. They got married and lived happily ever after. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because it is an ordinary ending for most of the fairy tales. Why do the fairy tales end this way? Is it because all the language is old and there is nothing else to say beyond it? Because the words are not enough? enough to depict happiness, because reading about happiness bores the unhappy reader? Actually, none of these are answered to the question. The storytellers have already known that what happens after the marriage is not pure happiness. They put an end to their stories with marriage and lead the rest to the reader's imagination. The reader, accustomed to fictitious characters' happy endings, does not question it and swallows the hook, line, and sinker. To question and to discuss the logic of this famous ending is left to feminist writers. As Angela Carter puts it, fairy tales are like potato soup. No one knows who invented it. There are millions of different recipes, and all we can do is to tell our own version. Feminist writers follow in Carter's way, rewrite the fairy tales as a kind of subversion of the patriarchal figures in the original ones. Janet Winterson, in her fifth published work, Sexing the Cherry, presents the rewriting of the fairy tale 
of Twelve Dancing Princesses, which was originally published in 1812 by Green Brothers. Winterson's aim, is, Winterson's aim to rewrite the fairy tale is, as a feminist lesbian writer, to criticize the patriarchy in the original story, as well as to raise awareness on the readers about the happy endings of lived happily ever after, after the marriage. By discussing the gender roles, she suggests that there is no point in prejudice and discrimination against homosexuals. In short, her aim is to challenge sexism and homophobia. In Winterson version of Twelve Dancing Princesses, each of the princesses lives happily, but not with their husbands. They leave their husbands, or kill them, and start a new life together in sisterly bliss. This situation can be considered as a criticism of marriage institution and its role to bring happiness to people's lives. In addition, their being in sisterly bliss is in a way the depiction of how lesbians live happily and find love, support and comfort in each other. And how is actually the original um, Twelve Dancing Princesses tale the Green Brothers version of the story includes many patriarchal ideas. As they are famous, <coughs> and I said they, I mean the Green Brothers, famous for collecting stories and imposing their own ideal of benevolent patriarchal rule. In the Grimm's version, at night the princesses are locked in their chambers, uh, which implies the imprisonment of women at that time. The women were not allowed to go out at night even in daytime without a companion. When the king, their father, understands that his daughters dance all night long upon seeing their worn out shoes, he declares he will let the one who finds out his daughter's secret marry the one he likes most. This situation suggests patriarchal items, including girls at that time should keep their enjoyments in secret, girls are not to enjoy themselves without the company of males, the lack of communication between fathers and daughters because instead of asking his daughters how their shoes are worn out, the king puts a reward for a stranger to find out their secret. Uh, and negligence to women's opinion about choosing their husbands because they are the cho chosen one. Then an old soldier tired of fighting at wars decides to find the princess's secret out. Having been given an invisibility cloak and being advised not to drink the wine the princesses will offer, he arrives at the palace. He is well received and sent to princess's chamber. A princess offers him wine. He pretends to drink it and to fall asleep. Then the princesses dress in fine clothes and escape from their chamber by a trap door in the floor which is another implication to a patriarchal idea that if a woman does something not approved by the authority she is dependent on, she is descending. It is quite similar to the idea, um, the phrase of fallen woman in Victorian era. Then when the soldier reveals their secret to the king, he chooses the eldest princess because he is old and it works somehow as the justification of giving the right to the soldier to choose one of the princesses as his life. Look, he does not choose the younger ones because a man always knows the best and decides on the best. However, in sexing the cherry, the soldier turns out sexing the cherry, the Kent uh, Winterson's version. Uh, the soldier turns out to be a prince with 11 elder brothers and each one of them matches with a princess and they get married, except for the youngest couple. The youngest of the princesses, the most talented one in dancing, Fortunata, refuses her face and fate and flees away in her wedding night. All the others live happily ever after, as stated earlier, but not with their husbands. Eleven princesses pass through a hard time with their husbands after that, they come together and start living in the same house again to find the happiness, not in their married lives, but with their sisters, a sisterly love, which is interpreted by some critics as lesbian love. 
Winterson's concerns in the rewriting the story are discussed in Princess's stories. Her attention is mostly focused on homosexual loves and problems which may occur between husband and wife. From a story about patriarchal control and the duplicity of women, Winterson turns the tale into a playful representation of forced female domination. The princesses kill their husbands, leave their homes, and escape to a new beginning with their sisters. Then they turn their home into a castle, where only they can rule. McCarthy claims that the fairy tale and the fable almost always have provided a forum for women writers from a variety of class and ethnic backgrounds to explore their literary identities. Thus, from the way Winterson criticized the original tale, her literary identity can be explored. By reflecting her vengeful enmity to men and marriage institution, Winterson presents her as excuses for being a feminist lesbian. Emily Valleza makes the definition of rewriting as a double work of reinterpreting and creating out of it. Winterson's aim in rewriting the fairy tales of 12 dancing princesses is to reinterpret a patriarchal story, changing it into a feminist one, and to create a blissful atmosphere where only women live, the house of 12 dancing princesses seems to be Winterson's utopia. As a detail, it is useful to keep in mind that Winterson is not the only feminist <coughs> writer who has written a patriarchal narrative, rewritten. There are many feminist authors who have retold patriarchal stories, including Sarah Mechland, Michelle Ann Wonder, etc. Rewriting a patriarchal story seems to be a useful way to criticize patriarchy and patriarchal institutions in a gentle and poetic way, rather than doing the same thing on debates. Just like how the original fairy tales implant patriarchal ideas in children's minds and generate patriarchy via certain stereotypes and cliches, feminist authors resort to the process of rewriting of their fairy tales by excluding the patriarchal ideas and by subverting them to suggest alternative world views for the reader. Moreover, Winterson criticizes the attitude towards homosexuals by including their sufferings in the stories of 12 dancing princesses. She criticizes the compulsory nature of heterosexuality in fiction and calculates its results. The only loving couple in the stories is the lesbian couple, in which the prince was a woman in disguise of a man. That way she hints the idea that love can only be between women because they are emotional, the sentimental ones, and a woman can only be understood and loved by another woman. This is just the opposite of um, platonic ideal love. As her basic concern, Winterson criticizes the institution of marriage by rewriting the fairy tales and including what happens to fairy tale characters after they marry. Winterson is against the idea that marriage brings happiness into people's lives and goes further stating in one of her interviews that she has usually been interfered with married women mostly because un anything outside marriage seemed to them as independence and pleasure. So, marriage is an institution in which women are dependent on their husbands, not as a dependence of being loved or cared for, but being seen as a pet to be looked after and spent money on. Uh, Winterson wants to point out to the fact that in reality, no one gets married and lives happily ever after. It only used to happen in fairy tales, and not even in them anymore. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Murude. Now our next speaker is Jana Negin. Jana Negin was born in 1989 in Istanbul. She graduated from Fatih Rüştü Zorla Mutlum High School in 2007 with the highest grade, and she has been studying in the Department of English Language and Literature at Istanbul University since that year. She is a senior student. Next year, she wants to apply for a master's degree again on English Language and Literature and aims at starting an academic career. 
She is interested in li literature generally, but specifically speaking, she is interested in postmodern literature, women's studies, feminism, and utopian dystopian fiction. Her paper is named Patriarchal Victimization of the Female in the Penal Office by Margaret Atwood. Now please welcome John Uh Thank you. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you, uh, Bilkent University, for giving us the chance to express ourselves. And I want to thank Ülkem and Özkan, uh, who helped us uh, very much. Okay. In the Penelope yet, at, uh, Margaret Atwood gave voice to Penelope and her 12 mates, the wife of Odysseus in Homer's epic, The Odyssey. She blends an ancient story with the postmodern perspective, which makes the story captivating to read. We hear the voice of the victimized women as ghosts from the underworld, several thousand years after their deaths. Atwood, in a way, breaks Homer's male discourse and provide us, provides us with the female discourse, helping us understand how these women have suffered. Having turned into a legend, Penelope now turns upside down the classical myth. She reveals through how many different ways the patriarchy makes women victimized and get complicit with itself for the sake of survival and the way she feels regretful for having to turn a blind eye to the victimization of the mates. When the ancient myth, the Odyssey, revised, it can be easily seen that the depiction of women is always through men. As in the case of Penelope, the book calls Odysseus as Shrewd Odysseus, you are a fortunate man to have won a wife of such a pre em eminent virtue. How faithful was your flawless Penelope, Icarus' daughter. It seems as if Penelope is praised, yet the emphasis is on the fact that Penelope is either the wife of Odysseus or the daughter of Icarus. Moreover, Penelope was renamed as Duck by her father, which is also a very open way of asserting authority by giving names, like Adam is given the authority to name Eve, quote, and Adam called his wife's name Eve, unquote. For the 12 mates, they are also portrayed as dirty and lazy by the phallocentric language, even though they are made dirty and lazy by the system itself. The language shapes the way we think, Without language, as Saussure puts forward, thought is vague. Therefore, it's so important for the patriarchal system to shape the thoughts of the society and create a thinking system through language, which is the first step to victimize women and assert power over them. Penelope welcomes the readership as a subversive character who claims to have known what has been said after her, what tricks have been played on her, especially by her husband, Odysseus. Quote, of course I had inklings about his slipperiness, his foxiness, his, how can I put this, but I turned a blind eye, I kept my mouth shut. Or if I opened, I sang his praises." Unquote. She turned a blind eye because she had to turn a blind eye. In that it's a wife's duty to be as much as subservient as possible so that she can achieve happy endings as, quote, happy endings are best achieved by keeping doors locked, unquote. When Odysseus comes back disguised as a beggar after 20 years, she plays the fool again, asserting, I knew the beggar was Odysseus. There was no coincidence. I set the whole thing up on purpose. So, Atwood Penelope is so aware of the fact that, to be able to survive, she has to hide her wisdom, as cleverness of a woman is seen as a threat to the male world, and, quote, it is a quality a man likes to have in his wife as long as she is some distance away from him, unquote. 
Penelope may sound sub 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 subversive now, but the irony is that she can reveal this side of her character only after she is dead, and she is in a state of bonelessness, liplessness, and breastless breastlessness as she is dead. So, no matter how rebellious she may sound, she has to suppress that kind of feelings in the presence of men for her, for her own goodness. When it comes to marriage issue, it also turns out to be a tool to victimize women in many ways. In the Penelopiat, Penelope's marriage is arranged by her father, the patriarch, when she is only 15 years old, and it occurs after a kind of contest of which the winner is Odysseus. Penelope interprets this as, quote, And so I was handed over to Odysseus like a package of meat, a package of meat in a wrapping of gold, gold mind you, unquote. So, as many women, she has not a word to say even about her marriage. What is worse, many men compete for her as if she is a material. By this way, by this way she is commoditized. The concept of marriage is also materialistic, as, quote, the man who won the contest got the woman and the wedding. He obtained wealth through marriage, unquote. As it has almost, as it has almost always been, marriages are for financial reasons and for having children through whom the male can be safe and sound that he has got an heir to hand down his money. It must be moving for a woman to be aware of this and lead that marriage despite these facts, as she describe her, describes her situation as, quote, shrouded in my bridal veil, unquote. However, the patri patriarchal system makes the victimization seem as normal side of all the marriages and prison the women to an institution organized by the hands of the male world. The Odyssey is an ancient story and there are apparent stereotypical roles given for women through Penelope. Penelope is the patient, faithful wife waving for her husband, always knitting in silence and she is reduced to a birth machine. It is man's right to be active and hero heroic like Odysseus. However, for John Fowles, quote, men love wars because it allows them to look serious because it is the one thing that stops women laughing at them. In it, they can reduce women to the status of objects." Unquote. Likewise, Odysseus and all other men go to war for a nonsense oath they have sworn to be able to look serious and courageous as they are supposed to be. Their object for fighting seems to be Helen. Yet, it's Helen's husbands and their own prestige they are after. The moment Penelope is given the inevitable authority due to, due to the lack of patriarch, she dreams of, quote, Odysseus returning and me, with womanly modesty, revealing to him how well I had done at what was usually considered a man's business, always for him, how his face would shine with pleasure, unquote. It is so internalized in her that her whole existence is for the good of her husband because a good wife always does so. A woman can be a wife and a mother due to, due to her sensitive, patient and self-sacrificing nature, but she can never belong to the area of business, management, politics, in short, to the external world. If she does, as in the case of Penelope, it stems from a must, and she has to do everything for her husband and his reputation, even waiting for a man loyally who disappears for 20 years is the very duty of the wife. That's to say, a woman has to be either the angel in the house or the provider of benefit for her husband. Having to take over the role of her husband, Penelope seems to be a victimizer herself after what she has caused, the death of the 12 mates. It may be wrong to assume that Penelope has abused the maids for her own benefit or she has done everything on purpose. First of all, Penelope gets married at the age of 15, which means she is only a child. 
She has no experience of life at all and she has no example to follow, follow as her own parents disregard Penelope. Her father tries to drown her and her mother never has a conversation with her. When she arrives at Odysseus country Ithaca, she has no friends and both her mother-in-law and Odysseus's nurse are like her mother. Penelope is not prepared for such a task as she was, quote, a princess after all, and work was what other people did, unquote. When Odysseus goes away, Penelope becomes, quote, a stranger among strange people, unquote. That's why she befriends the maids and Penelope says we were almost like sisters. For a long time, Penelope and the maids enjoy each other's company and share their loneliness. But when suitors swarm to the palace and try to get married with Penelope just for her wealth, Penelope needs to find a solution. She makes use of the maids as she has to learn what's going on around the palace among the suitors. And the maids for Penelope were the most trusted eyes and ears in the palace. Nevertheless, the end approaches poignantly. When Odysseus returns, he and his son Telemachus, together with the help of Euryclea, hang the maids who are found among the suitors merrymaking. But Penelope cannot utter the reality and consoles herself, quote, that is dead, I told myself. What could I do? Lamentation wouldn't bring my lowly girls back to life. I bit my tongue. It's a wonder I had any tongue left. So frequently I had bitten it over the years." Unquote. However, Atwood makes her character Penelope be aware of her fault and feel regretful for being silent even at the end of the novel. When the, return, when the concern is the victimiz victimization of women, it is inevitable to mention the lack of solidarity among women, mostly caused by, again, the patriarchy. The most striking rivalry is between Penelope and her cousin, Helen. Since ancient times, Helen has been seen as the type of woman that all women should hate and yet envy, and all men should fear and yet desire. Accordingly, Penelope conveys how wicked, selfish, and proud Helen is, and she is the one who ruins her life, causing the war. Nevertheless, she is so complicit that she cannot see the fact that men go to war for their own reputation, and Helen is just an object. Helen's abduction, whether she was willing or not, might be seen as a tool for Penelope's and the maid's victimization indirectly. However, Helen is just another extreme example of a woman stereotype. If a woman is excessively beautiful, she may cause countless dangers, even death. Therefore, all other women should hate her and veil their beauty if they have any. This femme fatale is hated by Penelope, yet it is a trick played by the patriarchy on women. How better to reinforce this position of servitude than create rivalry between women? If women turn against each other with disdain, they will tend to like dislike themselves. Increase in self-depreciation is helpful for, helpful for adjust, adjusting to a position of self-servience and moreover, their suspicion and alienation from each other will prevent close communication, intimacy and solidarity. Their trumps of up or full conflicts and mistrust of each other will deter them from targeting their true oppressor patriarchy. Patriarchy achieves its goal as Penelope has, quote, a desire to say that Helen should have been kept in a locked trunk in a dark cellar, unquote. If it weren't for Helen, Penelope most probably thinks that everything would be bright and breezy. That is the reason why she bears violent feelings against her own cousin, Helen. Apart from Helen, there is no communication between women, let alone solidarity. For instance, Penelope's mother is a cold-hearted woman, as Penelope asserts, quote, When I was little, I often tried to throw my arms around her, but she had a habit of sliding away, unquote. And Penelope suspects that 
If, I, if my father hadn't had me thrown into the sea, my mother might have dropped me in herself. Her mother-in-law also ignores and attacks her by cla claiming that, quote, you don't look well, unquote. The nurse Euryclea is another example of complicity in that she is the one who gives the names of the maids to Odysseus. And Penelope doubts that it's, it is Euryclea who causes Penelope to sleep while the maids are slaughtered. As for the maids, they put the blame on all people in the novel, including women, especially on Penelope, and they sing, quote, blame it on the maids, hang them high and don't ask why, unquote. So all problems are addressed to the women and the men go on their lives, victimizing them by taking their solidarity away. Margaret Atwood makes her Penelope admit that she can reincarnate if she wants, wants, but she refuses to do it as, quote, My past life was fraught with many difficulties, but who is to, who is to say that next one wouldn't be worse? Unquote. Because Penelope is conscious that the next life she would lead will be again in the hands of the patriarchy and she will be victimized along with other women in the name of safety and survival and she wants no rotten boss to climb and feel regless, uh, rest, sorry, endless regrets. That's all. Thank you, Donna. Our last speaker, Ülkem Önal, was born on 23 September in 1990 in Istanbul. Completing her high school education in Hagatar Mine, foreign language intensive high school in 2008 with the first rank, she was admitted to Birkent University with full scholarship. She is a senior at the Department of English Language and Literature. In addition, she is pursuing a minor degree in International Relations Department. She is particularly interested in contemporary British fiction, gender studies, and adaptations of literary works to the city. She wants to pursue a career in journalism after graduation. Her paper is Pushing the Limits of Gender and Sexual Identity and in Jackie Key's Trumpets. Please welcome her. Thank you, Hello everyone, as Dilara stated, my paper is entitled as Pushing the Limits of Gender and Sexual Identity in Jackie Case Trumpet. Jackie Case debut novel, Trumpet, is based on the true life story of the deceased American jazz musician Billy Tipton, who became enormously famous when it was discovered after his death that he was a female biologically. In her interview with Bold Type, when Kay is asked why she wrote this novel, she replies, quote, because I read a short news piece about Billy Tipton, which intrigued me. His adopted son was quoted as saying, he'll always be a daddy to me, after discovering his father had been a woman. I was interested in the son's acceptance of his father's construction of his, of the, of his identity, unquote. Accordingly, Jackie Kay creates her fictitious character, Joss Moody, in her novel based on Billy Tipton's gender versus sex conflict on their, and on their mutual love of jazz, jazz music. Kay pushes the limits of gender roles and sexual identity by representing Joss Moody, a female-born character who cross-dresses as a male and leads his life as a man. The novel starts when Joss Moody has died and his body is discovered to be female by an undertaker. Moody has been a popular musician, so the issue becomes, a, becomes widely discussed in the media. Moody is married, has an adopted child named Coleman. In the novel, there is a tumult of emotions and ideas of Moody's recently revealed long hidden sex. The characters each have their own account of Joss Moody, his life and his gender. His wife, Millie Moody, mostly talks about their love relationship and family life because, according to her, Joss Moody has just just had a body that was in some ways different from other men's bodies. Coleman is the one to learn his father's sex just before the funeral from the funeral director. Having constructed his masculinity on his father by considering him as a role model, he is harsh against his father as well as struggling with the memories of past. Jackie Kay questions the borders of the sexual identity and the stability of gender roles. Millie Moody is also an important character since she is a female, but because of her love, she accepts the sexual identity of Joss and decides to go on her life with him. 
Throughout the novel, the character, startled, startled by the revelation of Joseph's secret identity, tries to determine who Joseph really was. A cross-dressing female, a great father, a successful trumpet player, or just a scandalous case for media. However, for Joss Moody, it is the achievements of his life and his music's influence on the world, rather than his sexual identity, are the truth of his identity. In my paper, I'll analyze what the true identity of Joss Moody, how unstable gender roles can be, and whether their relationship makes Milly Moody or Joss Moody homosexual individuals. Firstly, it is most appropriate to claim that K deconstructs the stereotypical patriarchal gender perceptions and presents the reader the complexities of gender identity. <coughs> After the death of famed jazz trumpeter Joss Moody, which leads to the revelation that he was a she, people begin to question the clash between his sex and gender. Although he is a female biologically, he, pre he prefers to live like a man instead of a woman. That is what turns upside down the gender roles labeled by the patriarchal society. Even though gender and sex are quite different things, there is a strong tendency, particularly in patriarchal societies, to match these two concepts, although they do not have to match. As Judith Butler states in her book, Gender Trouble, Feminism and Subver Subversion of Identity, quote, there is no gender identity behind the expressions of gender. That identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results, unquote. In other words, she tries to emphasize that gender is the result of the repeated actions. It is people who shape the identities of genders, and gender and sex are thought to be closely related to each other, as she puts forward, puts forward quote, it's a political relation of entailment instituted by the cultural laws that establish and regulate the shape and meaning of sexuality, unquote. Culture and conventions create binary oppositions related to each gender. Joss Moody subverts the gender roles which are established through binary oppositions according to the demands of the phallocentric world. He is the resistant against the dominant myth of gender by representing that the dominant ideology is not the content of gender but merely a form shaped by the society. That is the main reason why he was believed to be a man throughout his life. He was successful because he did not believe in his sexual identity and determined his own sex complying with the expected gender roles of, of that sex. For example, Millie is a firm believer of just being a man. After math of Joseph's death, she repeats to herself, quote, My husband died. I am now a widow. That is what I will tell them if they come and ask me. My husband died. I am now a widow. My husband died. I am now a widow. Why can't they understand how ordinary that is? Unquote. No matter how powerful the speculations about Joseph Moody being a she male, Millie calls him her husband because Joss was a perfect husband and a father and fulfilled his duties as a man. Even the relation of Joss's biological sex is portrayed with the emphasized masculinity of Joss by Millie. Now I will read the quotation when uh, Joss's sexual identity is revealed by Millie. He takes off his blue jacket and throws it on my floor. He takes off his tie and throws that down too. His hands are trembling. I am trembling. I think maybe he has changed his mind and he wants to make love. I think, shouldn't he undress me first? I'm not sure. I try to remember what a couple of other boyfriends I've had, I've had have done. My mind goes blank. He's undoing the buttons of his shirt. He slows down now. Each button is undone so terribly slowly. Underneath the t-shirt is a t-shirt. He takes off that slowly too lifting his arms up and pulling it from his waist over his head. He discards it. His eyes are determined. He looks at me the whole time. An old look, challenging, almost aggressive, as if he's saying, I told you so. I told you so. He pulls the next t-shirt over his head and throws, a, throws that away too. He has another layer underneath, a vest. His clothes are spread eagled on my floor like the outline of a corpse in a movie. The vest is stripped off as well. He looks a lot thinner now, with all that off him. I'm excited watching this man undress for me. Underneath his vest are lots of bandages wrapped around and round his chest. He starts to undo them. I feel a wave of relief, to think all he's worried about is some scar he has. 
He should now, he sh should know my love goes deeper than a wound. You don't have to show me, I say. I feel suddenly full of compassion. Did you have an accident? I don't care about superficial things like that. I go towards him to embrace him. I am not finished, he says. He keeps unwrapping endless bandages. I'm still holding out my hands when the first of his breasts reveals itself to me. Small, firm. However, the revelation of his true sex does not alienate me from Joss because although she gives the account of the event in the present time, she insists on calling Joss he. This shows us that gender is something not solid or static, but fluid and mobile. In addition to Millie, his son Coleman also keeps on calling Joss father, no matter how, hang how angry he is with him, because he has been a flawless father to him for years, which can be deduced from his speech. Quote, my father had tits. My father didn't have a dick. My father had tits. My father had a pussy. My father didn't have any balls. How many people had fathers like mine? Which chat line could I ring up for this one? Imagine it flashing up on the screen after a program about fathers or mothers, trained parents, or whatever the fuck you call them. If any of this related to you or you need some, someone to talk to, please ring blah blah blah. The line will be open for next 24 hours. I could ring around the country and never find anybody that's gone through what I'm going through. I bet you. Unquote. Coleman is right in his own way since, since this is a shock for him and destroys all the portrait of his powerful model. However, his innermost feelings can be understood from his calling Josie Tilla father instead of she or even it. Other minor characters also contribute a lot for the deconstruction of the gender issues since they are most interested in Moody's character or music instead of his being a transgender. For example, Moody's drummer, Big Red McCall, answers, quote, whatever, Christ. Do you think I'm bothered? Do you think anybody is bothered? It's the fucking music that, mod that matters, unquote. When Sophie Stones implies that he should call just as she. As a result, Kay emphasizes that gender identity and biological sex are not related, but so-called manifestations of society burden, burdened roles on individuals. Perhaps the most important issue in the trumpet to be handled is the cross-dressing of Joss, because his cross-dressing is the thing which helps him to internalize his gender identity, which is in conflict with his sexual identity. His strong internalization of his identity can be understood from his regarding his Josephine Moore identity as the third person. Quote, it unsettled me, the idea that Joss has had all had not always been Joss, that Joss Moody had once been Joseph Moore. Sometimes later on, I would ask him what it was like. But whenever the name Josephine Moore came up, he would say, leave her alone, as if she was somebody else. He always spoke about her in the third person. She was his third person. Unquote. This is the indication of that he does not question his identity as a man. He does not appropriate his sexual identity, since he believes that individuals' free will is more important than what is drawn for him, as can also be understood from his speech with Coleman. Quote, you pick. You pick the one you liked best, and that one is true. It doesn't change me, who my father was, or where he came from, and it doesn't certainly change you. Unquote. Another issue to be scrutinized as a consequence of the cross-dressing of Joss is that whether Millie and Joss are straight, heterosexual individuals, lesbians, or none of them. As Alice Walker states in her article, as you wear cross-dressing and identity politics in Jackie Case Trumpets, quote, as a practice, cross-dressing destabilizes the system of binary oppositions that struck that structure Western metaphysical space. The cross-dresser, after all, falls between the marker poles of male and female, masculine and feminine, cultural and biological, conformist and unconventional. In a society that is obsessed by the question, what are you, a question that speaks to a deep need to categorize and authenticate individual identities, the cross-dresser functions as a disorderly and subversive presence by resisting assimilation, 
within a system of binary oppositions. He or she reveals the inadequacy of this system and furthermore questions the extent to which appearance and identity are coextensive." Unquote. In this regard, Joss is the perfect example of the cross-dresser since he finds his own identity under his cross-dressed body. I am quite against the idea to regard Joss and Millie as homosexual people since they behave according to their identity's requirements. Alice Walker also quotes from David Harrison's letter to Kate Bornstein in which David Harrison attempts to draw a distinction between the practice of cross-dressing and gay and lesbian identity. Quote, Someone asked me if the transgendered community is like the gay lesbian communities. I said no, because the gay and lesbian communities are based on whom one relates to, whereas the transgendered experience is different. It's about identity relating to oneself. It's a more inward thing. Unquote. In homosexual communities, people do not leave their sexual identities or most of the time their gender identities behind. They behave in accordance with the society's pressure upon them, whereas cross-dressing is the manifestation of the self. For instance, Millie talks about Joss's daily dressing habit and while explaining it, she emphasizes the non-femininity of Joss. Quote, he put on his boxer shorts and I turned away while he stuffed them with a pair of socks. He pulled on his trousers, constantly adjusting his shorts and the stuffing. My handsome tall man. His breasts were not very big. They flattened easily. Nobody except me ever knew he had them. I never touched them except when, he was, when uh, I was wrapping the bandages round and round them. That was the closest I came to them, wrapping them up. Other than that, they didn't really exit, exist. Not really. Unquote. By denying the natural body of Joss, Millie also comes against the idea that one is born with a certain gender because although Joss has, Joss has breasts, he does not act like a female. Alice Walk Walker, in her article, summarizes being a cross with a formula. Quote, to cross, if the intention is passing and not parody, is to, is to offer the following equation. If I am X, but I present as Y, and you see why and don't allow for X, then which is the truth and what do we to do with it?" Unquote. In Moody's case, definitely why is the truth. That's the reason why, despite of the fact that Mill knew Joss had a female body, she didn't care because she loved Joss and got married to him. Joss was identifying himself as a man and Millie as a woman with a, with a heter heterosexual past. Thus, they must both be identified as they want them to be identified husband and a wife. So, Sophie Stones, the tabloid newspaper writer character in the novel, is quite wrong to call them as, quote, lesbians who adopted a son, one playing mommy, one playing daddy, the big butch frauds, unquote. Because Joss does not turn into being Josephine when he takes his trousers off during their sexual relationship or during, during his relationship with Coleman. Alice Walker also quotes Leslie Feinberg's personal account on the complexities of this type of relationships, which she specifies in her book Transgender Warriors. Quote, Some people refer to my love relationship as lesbian because they consider the fact that my wife and I are female to be a biological determinant of our sexuality. Others who label me as looking like a man assume we live in a safe heterosexual space. Neither exactly corresponds to my life. So are my love and I, lesbian woman, mother and son, lesbian woman and gay male friend, or some other combination? Our relationship is Teflon, to which no classification of sexuality sticks." Unquote. As Feinberg suggests, it's more difficult to classify the cross crossers into one category or another since identity is involved in the process other than gender or sexuality. Hence, it will not be right to call Joss or Millie as lesbians. However, since they get certain pleasure from their sexual intercourse, although they cannot fulfill the natural bodily function, they cannot be called completely heterosexual people as well. In conclusion, Jackie K. with her novel Trumpet questions, destabilizes, deconstructs, and recreates gender and sexuality in the context of identity. It's proved that gender is a socially constructed, performative value which can be mobile with passing. Besides, cross-dressing is beyond the narrow perception of homosexuality since it challenges the identity of the individual, it is notable to remark in the end that Joss is more a successful trumpet player, perfect husband, and a father than a mere crossdresser. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Rikan. If you have any questions, our speakers will be glad to answer. I have a question. Yes. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the such nice talks. I, I'm really impressed by all of them. But my first question goes to Ukem. Ukem, in your paper you say that society, in a way, shapes the gay people and actually homosexual people and they do not change their physical appearance because of the social pressure. And you said, uh, I actually appreciate this uh, perspective. It stands out as a different perspective, but do you really think that do you really take the side that homosexuals are less courageous than transgender people in the sense like transgender people are, you know, brave to change their physical appearance but homosexuals are not? Do you really take that side? No, I don't because some of them just do not want to do this. For example, some lesbians or some gay people do not want to identify themselves as wives or husbands, as male lovers or female lovers. So it is also their option, but in some societies, cross-gendered people are looked down upon. So this is also another thing which makes them um, ignore being a cross-gendered person. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I have a second question to John. Not question, but a little bit of commentary. And in this work, uh, you know, Margaret Atwood's Penelope, and you talked about a child, right? right? A, a woman is married at the age of 15, you said. Yeah, of course. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> and how can you, these little works, you know, extend from their own countries and extend to the whole world? How can we uh, get these women's problems down to Turkey? I mean, we, 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 we have an issue of child brides in Turkey, you know, child brides. Yes. And, I mean, which aspects in Penelope refer to the uh, women's problems in Turkey, you know, these works extend from their own countries and I want to just gaze our own eyes to our own society. Which aspects, aspects can you find in uh, Atwood's Penelope? Uh, first of all, as you said, uh, in Turkey as well, there are many children who are forced to get married at the age of 15 or less. So uh, there is no difference at all. When they go to their husband's house, they uh, have the same problems. They even have problems with their mother-in-law. I say even because um, they, they are uh, female as well, so they can understand each other. Uh, the mother can share the child's problems, yet she is herself uh, has been victimized, most probably so she can't see what she's doing to her. So uh, this is the very same situation in Turkey, I think. Thank you for your comments. I like your papers a lot. Thanks. Any other questions? In fact, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask them respectively. So the first one goes to Nur Hude. Uh, it was about the fairy tales of uh, Janet Winterson, right? So, uh, you talked that uh, no one lives happily ever after. At least this was your criticism, right? Mm -hmm. So, don't you think that Winterson, in, in her rewriting, uh, creating her own fairy tale? Because, uh, in a way, she creates the, uh, let's say, the theme of modern fairy tale here. She, she's creating a kind of utopia in her own realm. So, don't you think that it's a kind of fairy tale again, you know, the matriarchal version, let's say. Um, yes. Actually, I told about it, but um, what she criticizes is the idea of marriage and marriage as an institution. So when they live in, live in the same house together, they do not get married. They live happily ever after, they get together, but not... Um, it is not like they got married and lived happily ever after. It is, they got together, they came together and lived happily ever after. And uh, since it um, breaks down the um, construction of family as um, like the couples as female and male, it is um, 
something other than what is um, pushed upon us by the fairy tales. Uh, so, uh, yes, she creates her own fairy tale, she reinterprets it, but the way she um, puts an end to it is not the same with um, the other fairy tales. And what she criticizes is, is the institution of marriage. It is like you may um, be against the church and still be a Christian. It is like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, my last question, if you don't mind, to Jana. Uh, uh, you, the title Penelopiat just reminds me the title Odyssey. So uh, we have the main character, the hero Odysseus. So uh, don't you think that this Penelopiat's journey, okay, it's written by Margaret Atwood, and what is Margaret Atwood's function in this tale? Uh, tale? Yeah. So, <laughs> so. Uh, don't you think, or could a man have written this tale? Okay. Could a man have written this tale, do you think? I mean, Margaret Atwood is the female author there, and she's creating that story, and what do you think? I really want your opinion. Um, if uh, a man could have also written this text, I think, uh, who, of course, had the same uh, point of view, with Margaret Atwood, and I think uh, that kind of man exists, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, she gives voice to women, as she is a woman also. I think uh, she, she uh, comments on the uh, situation of the maids and Penelope as uh, a very poignant, uh, as a very sad fact, because um, it is a victimization, as we see, but the male, co uh, male discourse uh, hides this and uh, shows that uh, Odysseus is right to do it to protect his reputation, etc. So uh, Atwood uh, gives voice to Penelope, thus the maids, and breaks down the male discourse, turns upside down the male discourse and shows the real situation. I think that's why the name is the Penelope. Okay, thank you. Um, firstly, thank you all for the wonderful and inspiring speeches. Um, my question will go to um, Diana. Um, in Margaret Atwood's other stories, she tends to, as a revisionist myth maker, she tends to give um, more stronger characters to the you know, popular mythical um, women. And in other cases, um, such as in Circe and the other ones, the protagonists are very powerful. I mean, they're really um, confident in their selves. And they're not rather um, sad, as in this Penelopiad. And I get the tendency that in your paper, Penelopiad is reviewed rather an, a depressive one, a sad one. She does not even want to come back to life again. But in the other stories, um, the females are stronger. They continue to live on. Why do you think that in this particular story, uh, Adler tends to pick a rather sad ending for her? Uh, because uh, in other stories, uh Atwood creates her own character as a strong one, but Penelope is already created by a man, Homer. So uh, she has nothing to do with uh, giving her a powerful role, because we know that she doesn't have a powerful role. She is not giving that role in the classical myth. So, so uh, that's what is in her hands. She can do whatever she can do with this story, this uh, Phallocentric language uh, makes this, and Atwood can do. Uh, Atwood tries to uh, show as much as possible how sad the situation is. She can't. She can't create a powerful character because she's not. She's not given that chance. Okay, I was just thinking that um, because we are seeing her side of the story, the perspective on Penelope's side, is maybe we could go more into her consciousness, we could more um, deeply analyse um, how she could alter her own fate. I mean, in Circe, for example, she was a misjudged goddess too, and she was very weak against Odysseus himself. And Penelope, as the wife left alone with the child, um, actually she is very strong when you think, because she is left um, all alone in the country as a queen, she has her suitors, but she um, actually has 
you know, the kind of power, if you think, um, to refuse them. And she is raising a kid on her own. So, you know, in a way, she is a powerful parent. So we could maybe see this aspect because we are revisioning all the myths again. I was just wondering on that. You, yes, of course, uh, Penelope is uh, a powerful woman, but uh, in the uh, classical myth, it is not shown like that. It is a must, that's all. Uh, the other, uh, she is praised, yes, she is called faithful, she is the panel of the patient, but it's the, for the sake of the patriarch, for the sake of her husband. So, yes, of course, she is powerful, uh, but uh, patriarch tries to drown her as much as possible. So, yeah, this, is the, this is the sad side of the story. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, I would like to add, well, I have one comment and one question, and both of these will try to somehow bring together what all of you have said. Um, first, a comment. Um, I was just thinking about Nur's and Ulkem's papers working together to think about both gender and sexuality. Um, and, and, and the conference, of course, is titled Gender and Sexuality. And I thought these papers worked really well together um, to suggest that um, there is something about alternative sexualities that really has the potential to unsettle and undo gender as we know it. In other words, queer identity somehow seems really relevant to the study of gender because it has the potential to unsettle more traditional understandings of gender altogether. And, you know, this is just mostly an observation that I wanted to put out there. Um, but my question will have uh, to do with something else, with marriage. Um, all three of you talked about marriage. And um, I think if, you know, if, if I were just uh, listening to this panel with a totally empty mind about marriage, I would hear the first two papers and I would think, well, this institution of marriage must be something that's awfully restrictive. It's, it's, it's just, it's a means for um, pa patriarchal structures to perpetuate themselves. And, and I think these things are true. Um, but then when I think about Ukem's paper, marriage acquires the potential for other things. I mean, in a sense, marriage itself becomes a vehicle for um, challenging patriarchal structures. And um, I'm wondering why um, marriage may have this hidden potential. Um, if it is actualized, it seems to be only sometimes actualized. And if we can think about why that potential may be there, and um, what, what the dynamics of such alternative marriages would be. So I guess it's most directly a question for you, Ken, but uh, any of you, I think, is welcome to try and answer. Actually, while reading the novel, I also questioned the same thing, because their marriage is portrayed as uh, flawless, perfect, and the only uh, time when they had uh, controversy um, between themselves is when Milia wants to have a child and just is unable to give her a child. But I think the, this marriage is like a, um, not unproblematic one because this marriage is genderless. <coughs> they both share their duties. Yes, there is this father figure, mother figure, but uh, between them there is no gender. Since their gender roles are uh, ignored, this I think leads to that it happens in marriage. Can, yes, can, I make, can I make a comment on that? I mean, if they, if they go beyond their gender roles, wouldn't that be an advantage? Sorry, I couldn't would, If they go beyond normal gender roles, which you seem to see as a problem in some way, yes. to me that would be an advantage, surely. Yes. You know, one of the problems with marriage is precisely fixed gender roles, with all that that implies about patriarchy, etc., as uh, all of you have 
to show up this morning, and I'll ask you a need. So going beyond gender would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Yes, they are also going beyond gender in this issue. Um, Maybe I misunderstood you. Yeah, yes, I said that their uh, marriage is genderless, and they're also going be beyond gender gender roles uh, because just is a female, but she she's he is. I always call him he is acting as a male, but I don't know. They always share everything. They they don't. Um, they don't behave according to the norms of the society. And in this way, don't they go, in your opinion, beyond the gender norms? Yeah, ab absolutely, but yes. you seem at one point to be worried about that. Yes, I was worried because uh, maybe they, there, there, there could be some, um, there must be some uh, problems in their marriage because uh, in, in some ways, uh, just acts like a man, like a father, and really acts like a mother in some parts. So maybe this could create some problems, or their, for example, sexual relationship could uh, make could create some uh, problems. But it is only in their desire for a child there is this problem in their marriage. Yeah, exactly. So I questioned that a little bit, but that was okay with me in the end. <laughs> Okay, firstly, I would like to start with Ulke and um, her comments on gender and biological sex. I think it was a very clear distinction and a very uh, beneficial distinction for the audience. Because, uh, as Jackie Kay says, there is indeed a distinction between gender and biological sex. Yes. You are just what you feel, right? But uh, while I was listening to you, I um, actually felt uneasy because I sensed that even in um, homosexuality, we see a kind of uh, stereotypical uh, you know, form of homosexual men, you know, a homosexual male should be effeminate. Right? If he is masculine, then it's wrong. In um, that guy who is, I mean, in his case, that guy who is cross-dressing, I think he's masculine, right? But he's just he is wearing uh, female clothing, so it's something strange for the other characters. I would like to. He is actually female. He is wearing male clothes. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, you might feel uneasy, but uh, I don't consider him as, as a homosexual because he doesn't consider himself as a homosexual and he doesn't consider himself as effeminate. So, so I is don't. genderless, something like that? He considers himself as a man. I am a man, he says. So I respect the character and. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you said, one is born with a gender, so if he considers one himself. Is, yeah, one is not as born with a gender. One is not born with a gender. He, he is born with a sex, but he refuses his sex, and he also destabilizes in this way the gender laws we accept from him. Just okay. So, um, and I also want to uh, continue with uh, Jana's presentation. Well, in order to understand Penelope's situation, we need to go back to the ancient times, to the myths. In fact, uh, in her essay. Um, um, beyond ending, what was that to say? Writing beyond the ending, and also uh, an essay by uh, Adriana Rich. They constantly say that um, the mythology is seem to be the um, portrayal of universal man. But when females look at uh, the myths, they do not find themselves in the myths because they are not existence. We don't hear the voice of females. So what Margaret Atwood does is to, you know, uh, revert and subvert and deconstruct these myths and put uh, Penelope in the center. And also, uh, I would like to uh, ask you whether you got the chance to read uh, Duffy's poem on Penelope. Uh, the, the title of the poem is Penelope, there is constantly um, a reverberation, say, anonymous, anonymous. In that poem, uh, Odysseus comes back and he cannot find Penelope waiting for himself. 
But in Odysseus myth, we, say, we see that Penelope is constantly waiting for Odysseus. I would like to learn what do you think about this. Do you think Penelope is in love with Odysseus? Is that the reason why she's waiting for him? Or... Um, I don't know whether... Uh, I can't say she loves or she doesn't love him, but she has to wait him because uh, it is not clear that whether uh, Odysseus is dead or not. She can't learn this and uh, if she runs away, she she's, I think, she's afraid that maybe he may find her or her son may find her and kill her. So uh, she has to wait for him because she's not sure. Yeah. Well, generally it is romanticized that what yes. Penelope is doing is good because she is a faithful wife, she's waiting for her husband, etc. So um, I believe that you know, Penelope has lots of suitors. She weaves during the day, yes. days, and then she unweaves what she's weaving during the day. And there are lots of suitors. They're just like the Theseus. If she chooses one of them, she is again in a cage, you know, under yes. uh, the oppression of another man. So she's waiting. In this situation, she's free because Odysseus is somewhere far away. Death or alive, we, we, we just don't know. She's just waiting and she's free. But if she marries, again, she will be under yes. the Nothing control. Nothing will change. Everything so. will be okay. And if she runs away alone, what can she do? At that time, a woman alone. So uh, there is no difference at all. If she marries another suitor, the same thing will, be, will happen. Okay, thank you very much. This uh, session was very inspiring. I'll, I'll read Jackie Case, Trumpet, and of course I will read Margaret Edwards' panel of Thank you. It's the end of our panel. I would like to thank our speakers again and to you all for attending. We will have a lunch break till 1 o'clock. Enjoy your meal.